So we're going to go ahead and get started. If you're still working on the quiz, you're welcome to keep working on the quiz. But if you're finished and ready to go, and open up to page 21 in the big packet. So here's the plan for today. We've got um, the quiz number one, which we're just now finishing up. Project number two is officially assigned. There are copies of it on each table. So make sure everybody grabs a copy of project number two. That project is due one week from today. All right. Project two is due on Monday of next week. And uh, today we talk about differential equations. Actually, Diffie-Q's is a subject that we'll study again towards the end of the semester, like the very last week of the course. We'll revisit it, but we'll spend one class period or part of one class period today talking about it. Any questions on the calendar? Project is due the 11th. Uh, sorry. No. Thank you for correcting me. Project is due on uh, the 13th. I missed. No. Wait. Quiz is the 13th. Yeah. Project is the 11th. One week from today. All right. Uh, oh, and uh, there are a few folks who never turned in project number one, so hopefully there'll be project number ones waiting for me in the folders. If you turn it in one class period late, that is today, it's a five-point penalty. Anytime later this week, it's a 10-point penalty. And after this week, I don't take them. So if you haven't turned the project in, turn it in very soon. The rain one, yes. OK, so differential equations will just actually start uh, this one little piece. Do you guys remember um, we saw the other day that the integral of 1 over x dx is ln of x? How can we check that this is true? Take the derivative. And we know the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. But there's one difference between what we wrote the other day and what's written here, which is written on your reference sheet. What's the difference here? is the absolute value, right? I, I'd be quite comfortable saying integral 1 over x is just ln x without this absolute value. So why does that come in? So let's take a quick look at this sketchpad thing that I made. So the purple graph there is ln of x, and the blue graph is the tangent line. And um, you guys know the derivative of ln of x is? 1 over x. So the slope of that tangent line is 1 over whatever the x-coordinate is. So at the moment, the x-coordinate is 2. So how much is the slope of that tangent line? Is 1 over 2. The slope of that line is a half. And as I move this guy to the right, what happens to the slope? It gets smaller. Now it's 1 fourth. And we can actually get really steep tangent lines if we go in here because 1 over a tiny number actually gets pretty big. Fair enough. What if I wanted to graph not just ln of x, but ln of absolute value? See, ln just dies here at 0. It doesn't exist from 0 to the left. But if I were to graph ln of absolute value of x, now all of a sudden ln of absolute value negative 2 is really the same as ln of positive 2. So whatever point I have here at 2, like right there, I'm going to get the same point right there. So what will the graph look like? Yeah, it's just going to be this guy mirror imaged. So we haven't, we haven't ever studied this graph. We never had reason to. We were fine with ln only existing for positive numbers. But if I decided to slap an absolute value in there, then I have twice as much graph. OK, fine. But what if we think about the tangent lines, like the slope of a tangent line out there? What if I were sitting at negative 2? What do you guys think the slope of that tangent line is? Doesn't it seem like it's going to be the same number it was over there, which was a 1 half, except this one is going to be downhill. So it'll be negative 1 half. And I think if I drag this guy over here, we'll get, there we are. So the tangent line in blue at negative 2, same slope as the tangent line at positive 2, just opposite sign. So is it true then? I'm back here. Uh, is it true that um, the derivative of ln of absolute value of x is equal to 1 over x? That's still true. So if x is positive, it's true. That's what we saw last semester. But if x is negative, like if x is negative 2, 
what did it look like the slope was? It was negative one half, which is exactly what you get when you plug negative two for this x. Do we see that? So this is uh, this is now true, and it's like a little bit more general than what we saw last semester. So if we believe this, then go in the other direction, we see why the absolute value comes in. It just allows us to deal with this integral on a much bigger space. Instead of restricting it to only positive x's, we can now handle negative x's. Still can't handle what x? Zero. That vertical asymptote, there's no getting rid of that. So ln doesn't exist at zero no matter what we bring in. But anyway, this is why the absolute value appears there. Okay, number two. We'll go back to Bubba. Okay, so ds dt we know represents what physically? It's the velocity, right? It's the change in distance with respect to time, instantaneous change. So if the satellite has a constant velocity of 80, I want to know how can we solve this thing? So can you give me some formula so that the derivative of that formula is 80? Where did this thing come from? Where does 80 come from? I heard ADT. What's the derivative of ADT? 80. Okay, so that's where it came from. 80 times T. Um, what's a good name for this formula that I just came up with? What letter? That's S, right? We had the derivative of S. This is plain old S, or S of T, if you want to be really precise. What's missing is the plus C. So we can tell exactly where this satellite is at any moment in time by just taking 80 and multiplying it by however many seconds have passed. Yep. Um, but we don't yet know where the satellite started, so I guess we can't say exactly where it's ended up. We can tell how far it went. All right, we'll go to Josiah for number three. Because we, we buy the translation, right? One function. So the second derivative minus the first derivative minus 12 times the original happens to be zero. That's a lot more complicated to solve this one than the 80 up above. Any thoughts on what kind of a function might work? How about a polynomial? What if y is equal to, say, x squared? Just making up a polynomial. What's y prime? 2x, y double prime, 2, fair enough. Does this work? Well, let's see. If you plug in y double prime, what do we stick up there? Stick a 2 up there, minus y prime, 2x, minus 12 times y, x squared. Is this equal to 0? I'm not asking you to solve that equation. I'm asking if it's always true. No, that is definitely not always equal to 0. So x squared didn't work, OK? Will any polynomial work? Yeah, probably not. How come polynomial is not going to work here? Yeah. Yeah, it might for a couple of numbers equal 0. Let's see, so, what a, so maybe a line would work. But let's see if we can eliminate polynomials. This guy was x squared. What if I made it x to the 10th? Then that x to the 10th is going to be sitting inside of this y term, right? But when I take derivatives, is there going to be anything else up there that's going to be able to cancel with the x to the 10th? No, because all these derivatives, the powers will go down. So no matter what I stick over there, that highest power, it's not going to have anything that it's going to cancel with. So polynomials all out the window. How about like a sine function, something that flops around when you take derivatives? y equals sine x. What's the derivative? y prime is cosine, y double prime, 
a negative sign. Okay, so I'm not actually going to plug all these things in, but I actually kind of like that there's a sign and a negative sign here because perhaps if we cooked it up right, the y double prime and the 12y could cancel perfectly, right? Maybe we could build something to make them cancel. What's the problem here? There's going to be a cosine in that y prime term that won't have anything to cancel with. Sign isn't going to work. Any thoughts on a function, a kind of function that might work? You want something so that, what's that, Maggie? Maggie says E. Something like E. All right, what if I write down just plain old E to the X? Why does this have a lot more potential than the first two kinds that we tried? Yeah, it stays the same when you take its derivative. So maybe we can cook it so that everything will perfectly cancel, right? The problem... Yeah, I mean, it's not going to cancel in this case. You'd have e to the x minus e to the x minus 12 e to the x. Okay, that didn't quite work. But at least they're like terms. And at least they have some hope of maybe canceling out if we fix it just right. So uh, I will tell you uh, one answer of this thing is e to the 4x. So let's see if we can verify. I'm not giving you any indication of how I came up with that 4. But if I tell you that there was this miracle that I had, and it came up with e to the 4x, can we verify that it's a solution? Sure, take the derivatives. So let's take some derivatives here. <clears throat> What's y prime? Yeah, so the e to the 4x and then times the derivative of the power there, the stuff. What's y double prime? 16 e to the 4x, yes? Okay. Plug each of those things back into the original. This guy right here. Go ahead and try that now. And let's see if we get something that's always zero. Did it work? Did it work? Okay, good. So we have a solution in front of us. E to the 4x is a solution of that differential equation. Again, it's hard to solve some of these things, but it's easy to check whether or not something is a solution by just taking derivatives and plugging in, okay? All right, um, so again, uh, so are you saying you're saying y equals like mx plus b, or are you saying y equals zero? Yeah, just go horizontal. Okay, Garrett has another candidate for a solution. Y equals zero. When you take all those derivatives, what do you get? Lots of zeros. When you plug them all in, what do you get? Zero. Does Garrett have a solution? You bet. Okay, there's more than one solution to this. In fact, uh, something to try later on maybe is I said e to the 4x, it turns out any constant times e to the 4x is going to be okay. So I'll stick a 7 there just to make up an example. And if it turns out any constant times e to the 4x is okay, then we have Garrett's solution right there, because 0 times e to the 4x will work as well. All right, any questions on not where it came from, but verifying that something is or is not a solution? Okay. It's a good challenge question to try later on if you're interested in thinking more about that differential equation. We'll go to four for Sam. What is it called? Differential equations. You can spend a whole semester doing differential equations. You can spend another whole semester doing a different kind of differential equation. Go ahead, Sam. We spend 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ashley, number five. Okay, so let's try this one. I want the derivative of some function, that's what the left-hand side says, to equal cosine of x minus one. 
one word that we've been playing around with in recent classes are we really being asked to find here? The antiderivative. That's all this is saying. This is really saying, what's the integral of cosine of x minus 1, right? Because we seek someone whose derivative is cosine x minus 1. So let's try it. Antiderivative of cosine. Is it sine or is it negative sine? It's, it's tricky. Is it sine or is it negative sine? Antiderivative. I love that every like we have several different like completely opposite answers, but everybody thinks they're right. It's so tricky. So this is just plain old sign. But take your time on that. Minus one. Where did that come from? Yeah, it's minus one x, right? What do we put at the end? Plus c. What's a good name for this thing we just came up with? This is our y. Okay. So really the differential equations that we're going to be asked to solve are generally going to have that form where it's just asking you for an antiderivative. We're putting it in different terms, but it's a familiar problem. Number six, um, Angus. Continue. Okay, so we've got our solution up above. It's the same differential equation. But now we've got this extra condition. So the graph of sine x minus x, you don't have to know exactly what that looks like. I mean, it's some sinusoidal function, but it's going to be kind of walking downhill because that minus x is going to bring it down. But that plus c, what, does, what effect does it have when you add c to a function that you know what it looks like? It shifts it up or shifts it down. So just imagine a whole bunch of these kind of staircase things, but shifted up or down. How many of these functions do you think pass through the point pi comma 1? Got this whole collection of stuff. Sine of x, but kind of going downhill sine of x but going downhill so in a sense all parallel to each other how many of them do you think hit the point pi comma one let's say pi one is right here only one of them that's right only one of them so our job is to find the value of c to make our sine thing hit that point okay so how do we do it let's just plug in we're going to plug in pi and one how much is y at the point is one equals sine of how much is x at the point pi minus x pi plus c to be determined by solving that equation everybody see how we plugged in cole cole says c is one plus pi anybody agree or get something different That looks good. Sine of pi is zero. Add that other pi to both sides. We've got it. So that means that our solution is that same function we wrote up at the top in blue, but instead of putting a plus c, you're going to put this specific number right here. So y is sine x minus x plus 1 plus pi. Any questions on that? I think that C is easy enough to do as long as you understand how to plug in. So are there any questions on how we plugged in the pi and the 1? OK, so then to be clear, if I just give you a differential equation without anything else, you are expecting to give me a formula with a plus C, a whole family of functions. But if I give you a differential equation coupled with an initial condition, then you are expecting to give me a function with no plus c. You have to find the value of c 
to make it hit the right point. Clear on the difference? Okay, this problem, a differential equation plus an extra condition, is called an initial value problem. I'll go on to the next page. Number seven, Steve. Okay, velocity is derivative of position. And what's the other part of our ladder? Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. All right, I'm gonna throw a physics formula up here, which should look familiar to most of you. Uh, how does it go? Uh, S of t is one half a t squared. naught times t plus do you guys use s naught for that one raise your hand if this looks familiar oh how do you write it going the other way yeah okay i can adapt okay so here's a physics equation did ted share this with you very early on in last semester okay so now we're going to see if ted was telling the truth so suppose a particle has constant acceleration a. We're going to derive the formulas for velocity and that red position function at any time t. It's something that you took on Ted's word last semester. Let's see if we can verify it right now. I am going to um, stick on here some additional stuff. I'm going to say that the velocity at time zero, just to give a name to it, is v naught, the same name that you guys have been giving it for a semester. And also the position at time zero whatever number that is, we're going to call that S sub zero. Okay, so those are our two initial conditions. Okay, so all we are starting with is that the constant acceleration is A. That's it. But in terms of derivatives, what can I write instead of acceleration? It's uh, the velocity of, sorry, it's the derivative of velocity, right? You could write F double prime. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to write it as dB dt, and I'm going to call it A, the constant. It's some constant A. So this is something we believe. The derivative of velocity is acceleration. In this case, acceleration is a constant, as opposed to acceleration being, you know, 7t minus 4. It's not that. It's some constant in this problem. So it's A. T, this? So over like, over T, right? Oh, uh, yeah, there is other notation you can use. If you wanted to talk about um, Y double prime, you can talk about it as a so D squared Y over DY, DX squared. And you can write it that way. Okay, so how about we integrate both sides of this thing? What's the integral of dv dt? The antiderivative of dv dt. It's not v times t. So like v of t, yes. Just plain old v. Right? We're just anti-differentiating a derivative. So they cancel. A is a constant. It's just a number. What function did it come from? AT, yes? That's the thing whose derivative is A. What do we stick at the end? Plus C. Okay, let's find that value of C right now. The only thing I know about velocity is this first purple sentence. V of zero is V naught. So let's plug in zero for all these T's. V of zero is definitely a times zero plus c, but on the other hand, we said v of zero, we gave the name v naught to. So how much is c? 
is just V naught, right? A times zero cancels. So we get that C is just initial velocity, which means this equation right here becomes the velocity is definitely equal to AT plus V naught. maybe as a formula you saw. Uh, it wasn't that the acceleration at zero was zero. This is uh, this is multiplication. Yes, it's not a not a function call. Yeah. yeah. Um, in some countries, they they don't write this. They write this. <laughs> I'm not judging. I'm just giving alternatives. We could start doing that. Okay, so now we have uh, velocity, but I'm going to integrate one more time. What do you get when you take the antiderivative of the velocity function? You get position. That's on our ladder. So by anti-differentiating here, we just get position very carefully because there's lots of letters here. T is the only variable. So what do you do with T? Where did T come from? This is currently T to the first. T squared divided by 2, right? Add 1 to the power, divide by the power. T squared over 2. What about that A? It stays. Constant multiple stays. Chris, you right? So that's the add one to the power, divide by the power. Plus, where did that constant V sub zero come from? It's the derivative of who? V zero times T. And because we just did an antiderivative, what do we stick at the end? Stick our plus C, that stamp. And now it's very close to the formula that you guys know and love. The only thing we'll do is grab this purple at the top right. S of zero, the initial position, we're just calling S sub zero, S naught. So I'm just going to plug zero for the T's, S zero for the position. So we'll go to purple here. All the T's become zeros. And the position becomes S zero. And so what does that constant become? That's not. So that means that this guy becomes finally S of T is, I'll rewrite that as a one half AT squared plus V naught times T plus, and then we just found the C was S naught. So I remember the first time I saw that formula when I was taking physics um, and uh, the teacher's name was Brian McGinnis and he throws this formula up on the board and it was like the most complicated thing I'd ever seen. And I said, where, where could this possibly have come from? Really one half AT squared? Why? Well, why? Because there's two antiderivatives, that's all. You start with a constant, you take one derivative, it becomes T, you take another derivative, it becomes T squared over two, easy. Okay, so, 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 let's see if we can try number eight here, and then I think we're going to try to come back and use that, that formula. Okay, so we'll go to eight. Suppose that we know, this is another multiple choice question. Suppose we know that the second derivative of some function is 8e to the x plus 12, and that f prime of zero is four, and f of zero is 10. And you guys calculate the original function f of x. It's going to be a quite similar process to what we just did. You'll take one antiderivative that will lead to a plus C, which you have to find, and you'll take a second antiderivative that leads to a different plus C, which you'll find. So see if you can work with your neighbors on that one. Okay, what was our answer for this? A, B, C, or D? 
What was it? B. Everybody okay with that? Take an antiderivative, find the constant. Take another antiderivative, find the constant. Okay. Um, um, um. So uh, one small thing. So I'm intending to change the groups up about once every week, week and a half. Today is not such a great day to do that. But when we come in on Wednesday, I'll give you a formula to tell you where to sit. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do, there's a challenge question here you can take a look at later. And there's another one there. What I'd really like to do is uh, look at this Superman clip. So um, I'm going to pause the video here because I don't record. I don't record uh, YouTube clips on my own clip, but if you wanted to check it out, you can YouTube this phrase, Superman 2 Niagara Falls. <laughs> okay, so here's our fact. The boy fell for 30 seconds. And another fact, Niagara Falls is 60 meters tall. So what I'd like us to do is just try to, I know we have formulas we can use. You've been using them for a semester and change. But let's just see if we can rederive that, the formula from before. But this will be, it'll be easier second time around. So let's try this. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to say that S double prime, which is the acceleration, I'll put an of t here. Now we can actually use a number. What is the acceleration here to, due to gravity here on Earth? It's 9.8. Let's just call it 10, make our lives a little bit easier. I'm going to call it minus 10 where negative is downwards, okay? Fair enough. Now we're going to take an antiderivative of both sides. So S double prime becomes S prime, right? S double prime is acceleration. So what's the antiderivative of negative 10? Negative 10, and I'm not going to use X, I'm going to use T plus some constant. Now, the moment that little Timmy dropped off that uh, ledge, um, what was his velocity? Presumably zero, right? He wasn't moving at that time. So, um, so this like tiny bit, bit. <laughs> yeah, we're going to call it zero. And I'll tell you, the wiggle is not going to be the problem with this clip. <laughs> so how much is C? C is zero, the initial velocity. We'll come over to here and just rewrite S prime of T is now just negative 10 T because the plus C is nothing. Okay, take another antiderivative of both sides. S prime, what does it become when you anti-differentiate? Just becomes plain old S. Antiderivative of negative 10t is negative 10t squared over 2. We'll, we'll fix that and make it a 5 in a moment. So just add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, plus some constant. So we can plug a 30 in, yeah. Um, I want to first find the c. I'm just going to define 0 to be the position when this kid fell, when he started falling. You could perfectly well define the bottom of the falls to be zero, but we'll just call zero where he started. So that means that um, if I plug zero in for the T, then I get zero as an answer. So how much is the C? Zero, his initial position. So that works out that way every time. So that means that our final formula is S of t equals negative 5t squared. We're going to call the zero, distance, zero position the moment he dropped. And now we're going to let him fall for 30 seconds. OK. Isn't it so much more gratifying to derive that instead of using Ted's formula? I mean, come on. OK. So uh, let's figure out how far he fell in 30 seconds by plugging 30 for the t. So s of 30 is negative 5. This formula is going to be in meters, negative 5 times 30 squared. So negative 5 times 900, which is negative 4,500 meters. OK. 
So if he really fell for 30 seconds, he would have fallen 4,500 meters. Now, I, I realize the metric system is far superior to the garbage system that we use here, but uh, I'm not, I don't, I, I can't understand it because I've been trained in the garbage system. So I have to say stuff like this, 4,500 meters in miles. Okay, 2.79 miles. So the kid fell for about three miles. Now, Niagara Falls is 60 meters. Okay, I'm not, I'm still really bad at this stuff. So 60 meters in miles, which is, okay, that's not a good unit. So how about feet? Okay, so he really only had 200 feet to fall. In reality, he fell almost three miles in the 30 seconds. So something is kind of fishy here. Um, so a couple of questions that you might think about uh, answering. Uh, first of all, probably somebody would not fall three miles in 30 seconds. What have we ignored? Yeah, the wind resistance. And that's significant if you're falling for 30 seconds. I don't know how long it takes to get to terminal velocity, but I think it's less than 30 seconds. Does anybody know? I can't imagine it's more than 30 seconds. That's a long time. Yeah, I'd expect it'd be, it'd be pretty quick. So, okay, we cheated a little bit. In reality, they wouldn't have fallen 2.8 miles. Maybe it'd be like 1.4 miles. I don't know. But it'd be a lot further than the 200 feet that they had. So a couple of questions you might think about answering. Um, uh, Garrett, what, did, what was your question? I thought you had mentioned one. Oh, I, I think Yes. How long would it really take? It didn't take 30 seconds to get to the bottom of Niagara Falls. So you might think about how long it really would have taken in reality. Um, uh, a question that I thought of, well, okay, maybe one of our assumptions here was wrong. If we believe the movies, and we do, why wouldn't we? Then maybe our assumption that gravity was negative 10 is not accurate. Yeah, maybe it's not on Earth. I assumed it was here on Earth, but I could change the gravity. What could we do? Make this gravity um, bigger or smaller relative to zero? We're going to have to make it a lot smaller. So you might figure out, okay, if it took 30 seconds to fall 60 meters, then what was gravity? Maybe gravity really should be negative 5, or maybe gravity should really be negative 2, or negative 0.1. So you can use our little formulas here. I'd encourage you to derive it. Um, I actually did some calculating, and it turns out the gravity that's required to make this boy fall 30 seconds and cover 60 meters is really close to the gravity on the moon. So if we're willing to say that all of the Superman series happens on the moon, then I got no problems at all with that scene. What, what problems do we have? Yeah. And there's no water on the Angus. So maybe he did that. They didn't show that, but he actually reversed time. Mm. So I'm old school, and the faster than a speeding bullet is the analogy that I've heard for Superman. So another question you might ask yourself, so Superman only had about like a second or so to cover that distance, according to the clip. So you might ask yourselves, how fast was Superman going? Uh, in order to catch little Timmy, um, and perhaps he was going faster than a speeding bullet, and instead of catching Timmy gently, would have done some very terrible thing to Timmy. And... <laughs> yeah, so lots of questions. All right, we'll see you guys Wednesday. Yes.